themselves. <laughs> so it's fun. Okay, so novelists, journalists, artists, spotlight social problems. Muckrakers. You had this progressivism, and I asked the, the uh, high school students this morning, or what, actually one of them asked me, why progressivism was such a big deal at this time. And <clears throat> so do you have any thoughts on that? What do you think? Yeah, how did it's because people weren't used to other people like stepping out. They were just they weren't used to different things. So they weren't used to people stepping into different or people stepping out of the norm, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, um, that that's part of it. Also, remember we had <clears throat> I always get an echo of myself, and I sound just really strange on the echo. It seems in my head, <laughs> it, to my ears, it just seems strange. But you had the business, and the business was this corporation, this corporate evil, okay? And as we continue along in this chapter, you hear the term evil. Um, you know, and are they really evil? I, you know... Maybe, maybe not. But, so you have the the corporate evil that's coming in, and you've had them push and push and push, and so everything's been centering around this, these corporate um, giants. And then you have this influx of people, millions and millions of people, right? And so the cities aren't prepared to handle it. And the people who are living in the cities are prepared to handle it. So if you're talking about <clears throat> the cities and the, the native born and who they are and are they, um, are they still in control or is it the, the machine politics and the machine and Tammany Hall and the immigrants who are gaining all of the control. And so you have this power play you have this corporate power play, you have this urban power play, you have native born versus immigrant power play, okay? And a lot of that is just human nature, you know, who, who wants to be at the top? But because of the corporate um, entities and them pushing so hard and all of the changes in society, you had reform in everything. You had um, alcohol reform. You had health reform. You had um, anything that, that society in urban America was dealing with, you had some sort of reform for. I mean, prostitution. You, <laughs> I mean, you could just keep going down the list, right? You had OSHA. Well, what has, <clears throat> has evolved into OSHA because you, the big business and the, uh, the social Darwinism of the time that said, you know, we don't owe you anything. Government doesn't owe you anything, and business really doesn't owe you anything. Uh, <clears throat> but then you have all these people dying, like in the in the uh, shirtwaist triangle fire. And you're like, wait a minute, you know, something's got to change. Okay, so people were pushing back. The middle class was pushing back. The um, the urban poor was pushing back. The elites were pushing back because they wanted to reform government and the corrupt government. So, <clears throat> and it's not just a national reform. It's like an international movement, okay? Uh, think of the Arab Spring. Think of how, uh, how much that was influenced throughout the region and, and even other parts internationally. Not as, not as much internationally as... Um, as say the revolution, the American Revolution and the French Revolution, right on two different continents, and and uh, you know widespread revolution and the colonial revolution that followed, right? But the Arab Spring and the, the progressivism at this time. So 
the, your novelists that we're talking about it. Hey, Nicholas, how's it going? Uh, all right, it's a little late. How's it going with you? Great. So whatever you missed is I've recorded. It hasn't been much. We were talking about progressivism and the leading up to progressivism and why it was so popular at this time. So that that'll be online for you to review if if you want. So the novelists <clears throat> like Frank Norris, who was writing about the California railroad barons, okay? They were doing things that <clears throat> you wouldn't be able to get away with today, right? Most of the things that people were doing at this time, you couldn't get away with today. But, okay, so you have the shirtwaist triangle fire that starts because they're locking people in these rooms so that they don't leave and they work for their eight, nine, ten hours a day, right? And then you have today, and, and that created oversight. It created um, fire safety. It created other safety. Okay, and we've grown and we've progressed. And, and um, as bureaucracies work, you create more work, right? And OSHA has come out of out of some of those safety concerns, not just with uh, fire, but you know railroads and and um, and hazardous conditions in the workplace, right? So you have OSHA, but then now you have um, you have OSHA saying that for every like in the university, if I have whiteout, it's considered a hazardous material, so I have to have a sheet on each hazardous material that I have, and I have to have that in every room where the hazardous material may be, so that people know what to do if it's ingested or, you know, if there's a problem with it, okay? So you have two extremes. You've gone from the shirtwaist triangle fire to white out, you know, white out for your page as being hazardous material. Okay, so so do you see where we've come since 1911? <laughs> all right, not saying that it's all bad, but I'm saying that we've gone from one extreme to another. All right, so as we're working into this progressive age and we're talking about and, and highlighting these problems, we're highlighting also social problems, like um, The Financier it was written in 1912. It was a tycoon without a social conscience. Okay, uh, The novelists would go in and they would actually go into the slums and, and live there and work there for a time and write about it. And at this time, and actually even today, in today's society, most people don't go into the slums, right? I mean, you don't choose to go into the slums very often. It, one, is dangerous, and, and two, it's the slum. You know, it's not necessarily a place that you... It's not a tourist destination, all right? So you have these people going in and writing about it and depicting what it's really like during this time. And it's, you know, slum life today in today's society and slum life in the early 1900s society is not very pleasant, right? So you have people actually reading about it now and it's being brought to their forefront, okay, as they're, as they're reading it and they're being inundated with it. And, and I'm not saying that it was a, uh, like a conspiracy to inundate people with with all these things but it was you know the the writers were saying we're going in and writing about it it wasn't like they were trying to beat them over the head well actually some of the writers probably were trying to beat people over the head with it and try to change it i think the slums back then would probably be a was probably um was a lot nicer place uh, or a lot safer place to be than today because today you have drugs added into the mix, horrible drugs, you know. Back then, I mean, you had alcoholics. You really didn't have much of other types of drugs. Right. You didn't right. have a lot of drugs. You had a lot of disease. 
um, you know, and, that, and the, yeah. yeah, and so, you know, tuberculosis, typhoid, some of those really easily communicable diseases were rampant, um, but they had just figured out what caused them, so that was something that they could, they could attack, and as in this progressive age, they were looking for data, okay, so the, the novelists, as they're writing about, uh, you know, the California railroad barons or the journalists who are going in and writing about the slums, that's giving people actual material to go back to and say, look, there is something going on that we can tangibly, um, it, it, it's written about and it's, a t it's tangible material that we now have that we can use to create these reforms, okay, or enact these reforms. And artists also were, were going in and, if you remember the Hudson Valley painters who were painting about wilderness and they were up in upstate New, what they call upstate New York, right? And it was these huge expanses, beautiful paintings, um, and really highlighting wilderness. Well, the Ashcan School was really highlighting people in their natural slum habitat, right? And and it wasn't always slum habitat. It was, but the tenement buildings and just depicting everyday life, very different than Hudson School, of course, because of of that. But artists often bring in different social. They're able to depict social situations in a different manner, okay? Robin, did you have a comment? Yeah, I watched something today about the documentary this morning um, by uh, a guy at Penn State. He, it was, um, his last follow-up was 1970, and like he would go in, he, he was going in, he'd been going in for 35 years to the same family in West Virginia, like in the sticks, you know, mm -hmm. and like documenting their life. I can't remember his name though. Okay. But so that's, that's what you mean by them, you know, they're like embedding themselves like journalists do with like the war and stuff like, right? Yes. You know, and... They're trying to to depict this so that there's, you know, they're trying to act, enact these reforms. And some of them are doing it because it needs to be done. Some of the critics say that the reforms were, um, people were targeting certain things. Like they were targeting racism. They were targeting um, anti-immigration. They were targeting these, these different things. Uh, items that they wanted to focus on, okay? And some of them were altruistic and some of them were because they didn't want immigrants. So they, that's what they were targeting. And so uh, <clears throat> as, as with all of these, as people are reading them, is creating a question and encouraging a question about the industrialism and the industrial elite, okay? And it's also stimulating pressure for higher and tougher business regulation because it's spotlighting the widow who has five kids and her husband was killed on the railroad, you know, or, or something similar. Okay, so <clears throat> you really get a sense of the harshness and the, um, but also the vitality of life. I mean, people are living, they're, they're surviving, and they're, they're um, thriving in certain ways in in life, and that's what the artists and and the uh, jar journalists were trying to really bring out. And then you have reforming local politics, but you have a the reformers who were battling the corruption in government. You have, and I keep bringing up Tammany Hall because it's such a, such a great example <laughs> to use of the corruption of not just political power, which was the Democratic, 
party, right? But it was a corruption of uh, the political process. And but it's a it's a case study that you can you can see and use and understand why people were battling these corrupt governments because they had monopolies over the sewer, the water, the the electricity. So, you know, you run a business and you're not going to play ball with with them. You're not going to get electricity or you're going to be charged double for it or, you know, those kinds of things were happening. And so the elites, especially the industrial elites, said, we're not going to do this. Um, and you had the, uh, the middle class who, along with the elites, were looking for a, a non-corrupt government. You had the immigrants who, in some ways, were benefiting, but in a lot of ways, the corruption wasn't benefiting anyone except for those who were the proponents of the corruption and who were making, you know, all the kickbacks. Millions, millions of dollars in kickbacks, right? I mean, they talk about Toledo with Sam Gold, the Golden Rule Jones in San Francisco, where uh, the attorney was shot and uh, Hiram Johnson, who, who later took on the case and followed the case, convicted the bosses, but he became California governor and then he became a U.S. senator, right? So it's, it's not just that they're fighting it, they're starting to win and they're having the public support for it, right? So you also have uh, the, the native born and the Protestants who are fighting the... Um, who are fighting Tammany Hall because, you know, the Protestants are going to fight Tammany Hall, the, the Democrats, because they are anti-immigration, right? Or it's for temperance or for many, many reasons. This is also the time where you have cities bringing in city managers to try to fight the corruption. And instead of having these mayors who are elected and could be elected by the party bosses and are elected by many times by the party bosses, you have city managers who should be, in theory, apolitical and not uh, dependent upon party bosses or those political ties to hold their job. So they should be able to do their job without having those political ties, right? So as you're as you're fighting Tammany Hall, you're fighting those um, those monopolies and going going down to the very uh, roots of these monopolies and of the uh, of the corruption. Okay, so <clears throat> as as you're doing this, as you're fighting corruption, electoral reform comes in to fight the uh, the elections because the initiatives. The initiative is where a voter can instruct the legislature to consider a specific bill, right? And as citizens of the United States, these are really important items that you now have the power to use because progressivism brought it about. The, really, the corruption of, of the governments brought these, uh, brought these reforms about for the benefit of us. Okay. Now, a referendum is when citizens can elect, can enact a law or express their views on a proposed measure, right? And then a recall petition where you can actually move a political figure from office, okay, if you have enough uh, signatures and it's, it's approved. Um, and these things that we have um, and our standard in in our consciousness were completely foreign at this time. So now you have a secret ballot and now you might be able to vote for whomever you think would be best, right? Not exactly who the party boss wants you to vote for because you have to tell that party boss, you have to actually speak to him and say, I'm voting for so-and-so. 
You know, you're not going to argue with the party boss in front of all of um, all of his cronies, right? It's very rare that people would do that. It's one of the ways that they put down voting in the South. It's one of the ways that they put down voting, you know, created the, the uh, political part, um, the machine in the urban areas. Okay. So then let's come back to the current time and let's remember the current event where we talked about uh, the photograph in, and I want to, it was in New England. Where was it? Vermont, New Hampshire, where there was someone who voted and took a photograph, posted it on social media. And there's a law saying you can't do that. And so they're saying their rights have been abridged because they can't post who they voted for. <laughs> and then you go back to this time of corrupt government and where they're just, they're implementing the, the pre-printed, and this is key also, pre-printed secret ballots so that people could vote for who they wanted to vote for. <laughs> so you have, look, you, you see how that circle has come back and forth? Right? Nicholas, is that, and I don't know if, I don't remember when we had that current event. It might have been last semester. But do you see where, okay, where it's kind of ironic where you have today's society and what people are holding as, as what they really want and, and uh, see as, as part of their rights in voting as opposed to the voting in 1900 with the pre-printed secret ballot? Yeah. It's, it's kind of ironic. You know, you go in and it's a, you know, you, you're in a, uh, a voting booth that's, you're surrounded so that it's private, and then you post it publicly. It's just, it's very, it, it shows you how the cycle of, um, of politics and and your rights comes around and around again okay because they had the same problem in colonial America in the um, you know in New England when they were voting in the 16 15 16 1700 even okay so but because of these voter uh, changes and because the party politics and the and the political machines have changed we now have uh, less voter participation and why do you think that would be less voter participation if you now have more uh, freedom in voting I would say people feel like they've got, they're getting what they want, so they don't feel as much need to be voting, I guess. I don't know. You know like today, a lot of people don't vote. They'll complain about stuff. <laughs> yes. Yes, they do. What do you think, Nick? A lot of people think that their votes don't count. Oh. Or to whoever wins, so mm -hmm. and so they don't vote. And some people are just too lazy to get up and go register to vote, or they don't want to serve on a jury. Mhm. Mm okay. So apathy, laziness, um, and those are those are some of the reasons, yes, that people don't vote. And also at this time one of the reasons that they're not voting is because they don't have those as strong a ties with the party and the politics that was going on. When you don't have that dependency or that constant contact with your party machine or your party boss, it's not as uh, integral. And also, that party boss made sure you showed up to vote. Okay, because you were going to vote for X candidate and the party boss was going to make sure that you got there to do that. 
or he'd vote for you <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> right? So the organized interest group political activity increased, but the local politics in that was not as strong. Okay, so the next slide, regulating business and protecting workers, as we're um, as we're talking about this, and okay, so corporate consolidation continued, and so you're continuing to get these huge conglomerates, and actually. I, they're not really conglomerates they're yet but they are huge businesses okay so they've taken 20 railroads and combined and consolidated it into one right or u.s steel 80 percent of all u.s steel production came from u.s steel and who bought u.s steel wasn't it uh, morgan Yes, it was. J.P. Morgan from Carnegie. Mm -hmm. Right. So International Harvester, they had taken six uh, farming implement companies and combined them or consolidated them, right? General Motors. Uh, so workers were actually benefiting with higher wages, but you still, if um, you still didn't have very many rights, you... You know, if you got hurt, you were hurt, and that was on you. There was nothing that the business was going to do to help you at that time. Okay, so you also had entire families who were working because children's wages were important, especially to the immigrants, especially to the poor. Uh, people were working in uh, factories, mills, tenements, sweatshops, street trades. Children were working in all those jobs. Uh, there were like over 1.6 million children between 10 and 15 who were working during, you know, at like 1900, in 1900. So uh, those 12, 000, 12 to 13 hour days, <clears throat> you know, in 1907, 4,500 railroad workers were killed. That's a huge number. E even though you have a large percentage of people who are working for the railroads, to have that many people die on the job is uh, is crazy in today's society, right? I mean, it, it wouldn't happen in today's society. But <clears throat> you have factory work that people are still having problems adjusting to. In the um, remember in Lowell, as the farm girls are coming in and they're working, the, they're now called mill girls, and they're working instead of working on the um, on the sunrise sunset schedule for farming, you're now working on a time clock. You have electricity, so you can even work even longer hours. Okay, but it was very strict and very managed and very different especially for the new immigrants who were coming in because most of them were, uh, the majority of them were, were poor, they were serfs, uh, you know, they, most of them had never worked in factories when they came over. So <clears throat> it was just a different speed and workers had a hard time adjusting to it. Uh, a, many of them resented that. But the but the big business, you know, that's that's one of the ways a big business was growing. And this regulation of the big business was part of the progressive the progressivism, this reform movement, you know, reforming them and making it a little bit better for the workers. As you had Robert La Follet, who was leading the regulation in railroads, mines, and other businesses, okay? He was fighting the system in Wisconsin. So he also, or the Wisconsin system, came in as having a direct primary, 
which was a new concept as well. All right, and then you had people working uh, to better the child labor laws or to enact child labor laws, saying that children couldn't work or they could only work certain uh, certain hours or women like in Oregon in 1903 women could only work 10 hours or only had to work 10 hours right instead of 13 14 15 and so the triangle fire after the triangle fire 56 worker protection laws were put in okay so um, so you see where this big business is starting to starting to change and and they've taken advantage of a lot of, of things up to this point where they didn't have to pay for their workers if they got hurt. They, you know, they were in it solely for the profit. And now with progressivism, they say, you know what, um, <clears throat> there are some things that the workers deserve from this. Okay, so you see a rise in unions as well. So workers are really pressuring for reforms because they're I mean they're dying especially in railroads and mines okay and you had the National Consumers League who was trying to improve factory conditions you had Florence Kelly who had been the leader of Hull or one of the whole house leaders she was pushing for um, factory improving factory conditions industrial hygiene you know, lead poisoning came about. People were figuring out, not only had they figured out germs like typhoid, uh, they were figuring out that lead actually was dangerous. Um, you know, uh, they're going to find out that arsenic is dangerous and mercury is dangerous. Okay, so, but it, it, this is a new field. Alice Hamilton was one of the uh, leaders in this field, you know, and, and lead poisoning was just really discovered in 1910. Historians look back and and they think that one of the reasons Rome fell is because of the lead poisoning, because all of the aqueducts led to the senators' homes and to the uh, to the elite were all lined in lead. So they're thinking that's that's part of the problem uh, that led to the fall of Rome. So. Uh, as they're working to regulate business and protect uh, protect workers, this progressivism is is seeing this type of um, this type of progressivism. Does that make sense? Yes. No. Maybe. Kind of. Okay. Okay. So, making cities more livable. Um, when did we become an urban nation? So, we become an urban nation once um, we create sewer systems and clean water. Ah, well, we're working on that. We're in the progressive age, so we're, you know, we've been inundated, and so they, they've developed it before this, but we haven't been an urban nation until, does anybody remember? No? 1920. It was in 1920 that over 50% of the population was urban. Okay. And much of that has to do with the immigration that we had at the time. So as, as you're talking about being an urban nation and the progressivism that's focusing on urban areas, you, um, this is one reason that they're, they're working on the political corruption. But as you have this influx 
of people, of immigration, you have to address the issues. And so making these cities more livable by providing public health resources or water, um, basic municipal services. How about sewer in all the tenement buildings, right? Recreational facilities, though. What do you do with all these people? Are they going to just sit in their tenement buildings that are 100 degrees on a summer day, if not hotter? No, they're going to get out and they, they need a place to go. So this was a reason that uh, Coney Island was so popular, because you could get out and go somewhere else that wasn't the inside of a factory, right? So, <clears throat> um, let's see. People were also trying to make it look good, all right? The electricity, put the electricity underground. Have either of you been to Japan? I haven't been there in many, many years, but when no, I was, I yeah, when I was there, all of the electrical lines, or seemingly so, all of the electrical lines are all over the city. I mean, they're, none of them are underground, and so you have all these electric poles that are, like, leaning up against buildings almost. You know, it's just really bizarre to see because you don't see that in the cities in, in the U.S., and it's not something that I think I ever paid attention to until I saw it in Japan and went, wow, there are a lot of electric poles here. Um, you know, some things that you just don't, don't even think about, um, but they had to deal with at this time. So they were dealing with overhead electricity. And so get rid of the overhead electricity, make it look better, make it safer. You know, can you imagine being in a tenement building and a little kid reaching out onto the pole. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, billboards. They were talking about regulating billboards and planning. And uh, so you have at the Chicago World's Fair, and the, um, they're talking about architecture to create more beautiful cities. And uh, Daniel Burham was an architect at the time who was looking for imposing public buildings. And you look at some of the buildings in DC now and they're all of, they're not all, many of them are of the same architecture where they are white or I guess gray, light colored gray, and they're very imposing. They're not, they're just pretty stark and um, large, large, like two or three, large. at least three, three four, five stories. I used to work for a, a, a sign company in San Bernardino, California. Mm -hmm. There's a crazy amount of things you have to do to be able to put a sign up, like even just a McDonald's sign. Yes. yes. And it's pretty expensive too. Yeah, it's true. A Anchorage has a, a sign policy where you can only have signs of a certain size. But the diamond parking sign supersedes that size and they were fined for it and they decided to, well, we're just gonna pay the fine. <laughs> but billboards in Alaska aren't allowed on the highways. That's why you don't see any billboards. Um, so they're working to- Oh, I've noticed that. Yeah. I always wondered why. They're working. Yeah, it's, it's a state law. So they're, they're worried about the cities, they're worried about, they want to make sure that the cities don't look horrendous uh, as, as they are growing. And so they're, the reformers are looking for better housing, they're looking for better garbage collection, street cleaning, okay? And that also ties back into your health because they figured out that germs create these diseases and if it's cleaner, then they're going to be able to contain these diseases a little bit easier, okay? Like typhoid Mary. They figured out that she was a carrier of typhoid even though she was working in a kitchen and so they quarantined her. So 
fair or not, is they stopped the spread of typhoid at the time. Okay, so uh, municipal hygiene became a high priority to keep these kinds of diseases from running rampant. Okay, they also started school vaccinations. And um, as they create this safe, safer water and sewer and regulating food and milk supplies, okay? And in some ways it worked because the infant mortality rate dropped dramatically between 1910 and 1920, okay? The infant mortality rate had been very, very high, and it dropped uh, because of that. And then you have environmental issues. So you've got health. Think reform. Think progressive reform health, okay, uh, sewer, industrial hygiene, okay, environmental, you have smoke prevention, okay, you have this actually smoke prevention association, <laughs> in 1906 it was, that was used, uh, coal in 1920 produced over 70 percent of the nation's electricity, um, now it still produces about 50 percent of the electricity and about 23% of all energy in the U.S., but they know of ways that it can be uh, cleaner. Not that they've retrofitted all of their plants to make it cleaner, because it's pretty expensive to retrofit or to create those plants, but you can get coal at a uh, 90, I don't know, 92% efficiency by gasifying it, um, you know, a lot of things that they can do now that they were developing then to make it better. Because the smoke from the Industrial Revolution and this, this pollution was, was dramatic. I mean, respiratory problems, all kinds of things it caused. Okay, so exciting changes were happening. The amusement parks... Again, what are you going to do? These people need a place to go. Recreational areas, amusement parks. Um, so, as you saw before, you have vaudeville shows to go to. You have department stores, uh, music halls. So you have these, these places. Now, the middle class said, no, we don't really like these places. We're, we're not totally comfortable with all of these places. And and what people might be doing in all of these places. So uh, moral control was something that was really a uh, another reform that they were trying to, to institute. And, you know, by instituting things like the, the Mann Act of 1910, where it was illegal to uh, transport women across a state line for immoral purposes. So immoral purposes could be widely interpreted, interpreted depending on where you were and what color your skin was, right? So they used it to shut down red light districts in different places, but they also used it to entrap people or blackmail people like uh, Jack Hobbs, Jack Johns, who was a heavyweight boxer champion who was black. He escaped to Europe because of this conviction. He was trying to escape and but you so you've got this moral control fighting these these uh amusements and and different changes so as people are out in the city walking it because you can walk at night now with the electric lights um you can take the street cars to coney island you can um you can ride in the Model T, right? Or you have the Wright brothers who who created the, they weren't actually the first to have an airplane, but they had a successful flight and, um, and created the, the airplane industry, right? Or led to the, to the industry. And then Ragtime has always been controversial, not always, but it's been controversial in the in the white community and in the Protestant 
community, okay? But you also have blues and movies. Movies came out of vaudeville because you had these these shows, okay? And Great Train Robbery was the first one to actually tell a story, the first movie to actually tell a story. So it was in 1903. Pretty pretty cool. You can actually find all both of the the Kiss and the Great Train Robbery on YouTube. They're kind of fun to watch. Um, so these diversions that people were looking for, especially the poor, were also seen by the the native born and the middle class as being a place where vice can run rampant. Okay, so they had film censorship boards. They had um, they had statistics. They created statistics on social evils. Okay, but they also passed anti-prostitution laws and they had vice investigations. They did research on sexually transmitted diseases. So they were, um, you had these, these two camps that were saying, we need a place to go, we want to, to do something different, and the, uh, the other camp said, well, these places that you're going, they might not be good for society, so we're going to try to regulate them. Okay? And so that's how you get like the the man act and you come in with the anti saloon league okay because alcohol and drugs are alcohol is still pretty big remember alcohol has been pretty prevalent in our society uh you know that we kind of almost went to war over the whiskey rebellion with alexander hamilton taxing the whiskey in western pennsylvania Right. Didn't quite get to war because uh, President Washington put the kibosh to it, but it was a big deal. And the ability to to uh, brew alcohol as well as to consume alcohol. So um, you had temperance societies who were trying to... Does everybody understand temperance? What it's about? give you a clue. It's either alcohol or drugs. What do you think, Nick? I'm assuming uh, temperance society is like an anti-alcohol type of society. Ding, ding, ding. Two points for you. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. And so they had always, the temperance uh, movement had always been for a reduced amount of alcohol consumption, and now they're going for a full-blown cut it all off, um, no more alcohol consumption, a total ban on the sale of alcohol, right? So the Anti-Saloon League comes out with these statistics, okay? And you see that... Um, Yes, you have some people who drink a lot, and, you know, some people would say maybe too much. But you also have different cultures who think that it's okay to drink in one culture, and one culture that says it's not okay to drink. Okay? So, so it goes beyond just the alcohol. It goes to the culture and the very fabric of, of some of the people's lives. Right? So... <clears throat> National prohib prohibition becomes a goal of the Anti Saloon League, and the um, the alcohol did lead to domestic violence and health problems and and workplace injuries. Um, alcohol was definitely even th well even today it's part of uh, domestic violence. Um, you know it kind of ebbs and flows, but there were there were times when alcohol was a prevalent reason for some of the domestic violence. Um, 
So some of the critics be, of the temperance movement is that it was an attack on the immigrants because the immigrants are generally the ones who are okay culturally to drink. And it was the Protestant uh, native born, especially in New England, who said it's not okay to drink. So, um, so it's a much deeper, more complex issue than just banning alcohol, right? And then drug use, again, people are just understanding, they just under, started understanding uh, germs, and now they're freely dispensing things like opium and cocaine, morphine, heroin, uh, you know, Coca-Cola had real cocaine in Coke at one point. Um, so they're figuring out, well, maybe this isn't the best idea where anybody can, can just access all of this. So the Harrison Act in 1914 banned the distribution of those drugs unless a physician or a pharmacist was, uh, had written some orders for it. Okay? Because previously you could get whatever you thought you needed. Yeah. So this is a picture of the first power flight, uh, December 17th of 1903. And again, they weren't the first to actually lift off, but they were the most well-known. Okay, they, they get the credit for the first uh, flight. And, you know, the first flight led to those exciting changes. I mean, air travel has changed the world. And then here you have the actual flying machine, the right flying machine. This is the one in the Smithsonian Institution in the Museum of Natural, no, Museum of Air and Space. Have you been there? Or heard of the Air and Space Museum? No. Nope. I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. I haven't been there though. Yeah, it's an amazing place they have you know, the Apollo uh, lunar landing thing. They have airplanes and rockets and, you know, the Wright Brothers flying machine. It's, it's pretty cool. It's huge. It's huge. And they have another one that actually has more in it. And then you can see a, um, here's one of the, who was it, Wilbur or Oliver? They, um, I want to say they drew straws to figure out who could go. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the, the one won and one lost. But they were bicycle repairmen. So, you're coming from a bicycle repair shop and you're creating a flying machine. Okay, this is the kind of technology and the, and the kind of innovation that's leading to, uh, you know, reform and, and different movements. People were really, um, really expanding and thinking outside the box at this time. Kind of fun to see. I highly recommend uh, Air and Space. It's the favorite of most people who go to the museums. Unless you're really geeky and like the art and, you know, it's very fun. So, immigration was the main source of, of the urban growth, like we said. Over 17 million newcomers came through Ellis Island between 1900 and 1917. So, this isn't just a small influx. This is like a full-on barrage of new people new ideas, new food, new everything, right? New language, everything. And a lot of them were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. 
Uh, you also had Japanese, Chinese, and Mexicans coming over, not in as as great of numbers, but they they were definitely um, adding to the number of immigrants who were here. And so there was immigration restriction. People were going, wait a minute, you, we are being inundated to the point that we need to do something. We need to slow it down. We need to stop it. We need to do something uh, about this. So in 1911, there was a congressional report and that congressional report wrote about the new immigrants' innate degeneracy. So they were using the progressive statistics to depict that um, that the new immigrants were degrading society and they had a degenerative um, they were they were a degenerative race or races. And so, the eugenics movement was talking about the uh, the control, like the um, the control of reproduction. So, keep out the inferior stock, A.K.A. keep out the inferior immigrants who want to come here, okay? Because they are inferior to to who we are. So this was a congressional report, and they also um, had put in literacy tests. Uh, bills, which had been vetoed by the president. However, it got overridden. Uh, they overrode Will Woodrow Wilson's veto in 1917. So no one with without formal education was able to immigrate. Okay, so they were um, they were putting in controls, but they were putting in controls that in today's society would never fly because they were talking about degenerative uh, people and races, right? So Madison Grant wrote Passing of the Great Race in 1916 with data to denounce the immigrants. So again, they're using data and they're using it to whatever they've decided they, they want to prove. Okay, is that unlike today? Well, we use data for everything, for to find out statistics and then what percentage of people are, you know, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. We do. We use data. And if you ever, any of you take uh, statistics, you'll learn, or at least this is what my statistics professors told me, that you can take data and you can make it say whatever you want to make it say. <laughs> You can take the data and prove one thing and you can, yeah, you can take it and, and make it prove X and you can take the same data and make it prove Y and it's the exact same data. So they're using data here to say to, for social control. All right. So you're not going to, you're going to keep out the immigrants by claiming that they are uh, of a lower or inferior genetic stock, right? But they also talked about sterilizing people so that they could not reproduce, okay? Um, sterilization, so crazy. well, it, it's not crazy. To think, about, think about World War II and what Hitler was doing in World War II, okay? That's very true, very true. Mm -hmm. And I know of people who were sterilized even to even into the 60s, 70s. I want to say maybe 70s, as late as the 70s. Uh, you know, so it was actually upheld. Sterilization was actually upheld in by the Supreme Court in 1927 in the Buck versus Bell um, case. So very different than what we can do today. Like my, well, my, like my, my aunt, um, she had a brain tumor. So I mean, she lived until she was like 53, just a couple years ago, she passed away, but she had a brain tumor, so she was mentally retarded and she ended up, um, I guess they don't call it that anymore, but that's what it was. But she ended up, she was at like a home 
or it was like a day school thing and she ended up getting pregnant and so she had a kid and so my grandma had to take care of the kid and my grandma wanted to have her sterilized so this couldn't happen again you know just in case you know she took her out of school and everything but like no court in california would allow her to do it she even took it to the supreme court and they wouldn't allow her to do it either uh, this was in 1990 yep so it's crazy that they were doing this even this many years before yeah yeah, certainly. So um, racism and progressivism, racism has not gone away. And so during progressivism, progressivism it actually rose and in intensified it at times. So you had movements during this time because you have more industrialization. So you have a lot of Southern blacks who are moving to the industrial north for work, okay? But at the same time, you have the immigrants, the millions of immigrants who are moving in. So you're competing for a certain number of jobs. And so racism between the new immigrants and the blacks was prevalent. But there was um, also racism between the blacks and the, uh, the native born, right? And so uh, as you look at the movement of, of African Americans during this time, some of it was, you know, Jim Crow laws in the South, segregated streetcars and schools, parks, cemeteries even. Um, you had the Supreme Court that was restricting residential uh, segregation. So about 200,000 blacks were moving north between 1890 and 1910. Because in 1900, most blacks in living were living in the rural South as sharecroppers or tenant farmers. Okay, so um, by 1920, uh, 1.4 million blacks had moved north to work, and mostly in the cities. Okay, but there was, um, you know, there was racism, there was segregation, there were colored districts you had the um, separate but equal schools you know you had the separate schools but were they equal today in today uh, are the schools equal you know um, you know urban schools versus rural schools versus uh, upper class neighborhoods versus middle class versus um, lower class neighborhoods you know, there, there's a difference uh, in, in the schools even today. So there, were, there was very little political influence um, in the ballots, and there was some violence. You had race riots, like Atlanta had race riots. Lynching, of course, was a problem. It had been a problem and, and continued to be a problem. You had, um, from all of these problems, you, you had the rise of black churches. And, and we've talked about this before, where black churches have um, become one of the cornerstones of black society, right? And you have, but you also have colleges, like Howard University in Washington, D.C. You have... Um, the Negro League in baseball, right? So some segregation still, uh, and but it's creating these strong black institutions. Or I guess maybe it's not creating all of them, but it's definitely um, deepening their them. Okay, so <clears throat> progressivism would sometimes help the blacks, but oftentimes wouldn't, uh, wouldn't help the blacks. So the same could be said for women, the same could be said for, uh, for natives, you know, it, it, progressivism wasn't fixing everything for everyone, okay? You had special things that, in progressivism, special reforms that would attack one issue that maybe would help someone. 
or was it uh, was it anti you know was was it the attack okay so uh, Roosevelt Roosevelt had a you know a mixed record with uh, with blacks and progressivism and President Wilson uh, had a worse record with blacks and and that in his during his tenure as president. So <clears throat> there were some who were leading organizations against racism. And you have Ida Wells Barnet and or Barnett and W. E. B. Du Bois. And they're they're fighting the racism, they're fighting the uh, segregation. Dubois had a PhD from Harvard, so very well, well educated gentleman who who was writing during the Progressive Age. He was he was a progressive. He was definitely working for reform. Um, Ida Wells Wells Barnet, she got into it because they burned her building and and uh, all of her information so she had written a red record there and the national association for the advancement of color people the NAACP this is when the NAACP came about because you had Dubois and you had Oswald Garrison Villard who by the way is a relative or grandson of um, Lloyd Garrison okay um, they were he was a white reformer Dubois of course was black and they were working together to try to reform uh, the segregation in the and the racism that they were seeing okay or that they were um, that they were a part of and so you were really attracting with this organization against racism you were attracting the middle class, the black middle class. Okay, D any questions? No, not no. Really. Okay, all right, so the revival of the women's suffrage movement. <clears throat> okay, women's suffrage movement hasn't gone away. Uh, it took kind of a back seat, but in the reform movement, and the fact that women are being more involved in in these various reforms they're also becoming more involved in women's suffrage again and so you have uh, people like in California they had women's clubs who were working on the city and uh, and local government and they were working on public school issues and so you have the elite and the middle class who are really leading this reform the working class and blacks and and that most of them weren't uh, weren't as involved as the uh, as the upper class and the and the middle class white native born but it doesn't mean that they weren't involved at all right and so <clears throat> it was revitalizing the national movement and Carrie Chapman Cat took over after Susan B. Anthony and the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And she really was pushing uh, for suffrage. And they started a new marketing campaign. They had newspaper ads. They went out and, and had posters. They had photo ops. They, they staged parades. Okay, so they were really putting it out there, and they uh, they were really working state by state. But then Alice Paul, who was also involved in the suffrage movement, didn't agree with the state by state. She wanted national, right now, and so um, she started in 1913 the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage which became the National Women's Party in 1916, okay? She wanted an, an amendment to enact uh, 
to enact women's suffrage, and she was really pressuring Congress. So they were targeting the party in power, which happened to be the Democrats at the time. Okay, so you, you see this movement, and you see another splinter in the movement. Before, the, the last splinter you saw in the women's suffrage movement was because of black suffrage and women's suffrage. You know, could you do the both together? All right, now you're seeing a splinter in the movement because you have, uh, it's strategic. You know, are you going to first start on the state level or are you going to go just national all the way? Right? So, as women's sphere and women's suffrage is working, it's really not only for women, it's also about children. It's all about, um, in, the, in the progressive age, you're talking about unsafe foods, you're talking about playgrounds, you're talking about slums and nurseries. You know, what, what do you do? What is important to, in the women's sphere, is the home, right? All these things affect the home. They affect the children, they affect um, the women's sphere. And so they're, women are really working in this progressive movement to fix these things. Okay, so as, as you have this sphere and you start working on all these different fronts, your sphere keeps expanding or is it blo exploding, right? Are you getting rid of it entirely? Right. So you have Emma Goldman was one who was working on politics and feminism and Ellen Richards uh, and Marion Talbot. So you have these uh, various women working uh, through universities, through um, politics, just doing different things to expand uh, women's uh, influence, I guess, and the opportunities. And so women in economics were talking about the, the ch state-run child care centers and the domestic tasks and the collectivization of cooking. And um, so Margaret Sanger was talking about birth control and the, she was on a birth control crusade where um, artificial birth control could be used. All right, she started the first birth control clinic in Brooklyn in 1916. And then uh, Mary Dennett, disagreed and wanted a widespread uh, availability of birth control, where Sanger said, no, it should be dispensed by physicians. Um, so you have splinters within these movements, but you have a greater movement, right? And so they were, um, they were working on that, and then you had workers organizing, so you had labor unions, okay, I can't talk. Labor unions that were expanding, uh, reforming the workforce. You have the, um, gosh, again, with the immigrants that were coming in, you have the unions growing from 625,000 people in 1900 to 4 million in 1920. Okay? And some of that is because the unions could now help the workers, and they were working to help the workers. And you also have uh, the lessening of the, the bosses, the party bosses, so the unions were growing in power. Okay? So the immigrants who are, of course, uh, hungry for jobs are looking for basically any way to support their families and the unions were very um, supportive, right? Or they were working to support all workers, okay? And there were boycotts in support of strikes. Uh, the unions, you know, they had mainly traditional skilled trades but not the factories. 
the United Ladies Garment Workers Associate or Union was founded. Uh, after the Triangle Fire, there was a strike because of the the, con the workers' conditions. Okay, some lost their jobs, but also it was about higher wages, and uh, they were able to to gain some higher wages. The Industrial Workers of the World in 1905, they were talking about timber and lumber, itinerant laborers. You had strikes of Kyle, of course, in the Nevada mines, and um, you had the timber in the Northwest. There was a um, there was a reputation for violence that your book says has been exaggerated, which it, it most likely has in some cases. There were quite a few violent protests, and there had been violent protests before, right? Between the, the business and, like, the, uh, the detectives that they had hired. Remember? So... You also have socialism coming about. So you have the the workers, the middle class workers. Karl Marx. Who's Karl Marx? Do you remember? <laughs> Good job, Nick. <laughs> Marxism. Marxism, right? And that was all about socialism. So socialism is actually advancing during this time, and. Okay, this is 1900 to 1917. Socialism is gaining momentum in this country because it speaks to the workers. It speaks to equality. It speaks to what these workers did not see, right? The lower class did not see these things. All right, so the Socialist Party of America ran Eugene Debs for president five times between 1900 and 1920. Okay, um, 1912, you had the highest membership. They elected a uh, Victor Berger as a socialist congressman. Okay, who's running as a socialist today? Bernie Sanders. Exactly, Bernie Sanders. So, Bernie. yeah, so you have another socialism, uh, uh, another rise in socialism or potential rise in socialism. So uh, this would be a great topic for discussion as we as we progress further toward the the election and you know where is where is this coming from? Where is the social the rise in socialism? Or is there really a rise in socialism? Or is it just that um, he's very popular in the in the presidential election? Or at least he was in Iowa. Okay, and here you have a Bastille Day picket with women and and men. Okay, so here's the women's suffrage between before the nineteenth amendment. So nineteen thirteen women gained the full voting rights in Alaska. When did natives gain the full voting rights in Alaska? Wait a minute. Before you answer that, let me remember if I remember. 2024. It was 1920 or 2024. I have to look it up again. It was after women. Okay. So that's... Uh, that's that's my point with that. Um, I'll have to look it up. I I just it slipped my mind right now. But it's after women gained the vote. 